uh, everyone, welcome. Welcome to our next lecture. It's from Hendrik. Hendrik, you can introduce yourself and hope you have a good time. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Hendrik and I'm going to talk to you about uh, mostly, let's say, philosophical things today. Uh, who am I? Um, I go into in a second. The topic is how to raise your own game dev story and survive 15 years and more. And including 2020. Let's say 2020 was special, right? I think for all of us. So first things first, who, who am I? Um, I'm, I'm Hendrik, I'm from Munich, Germany, and I have been a gamer since I was four years old. That's 39 years ago. So I would call myself a veteran gamer. I still am a hardcore gamer. Uh, and I uh, started making money with games, you know, in old copy rings and stuff like that. Uh, that is, of course, all things of the past. But already um, as a kid in primary school, I started being so engaged that I had to build those copy rings, not to make money actually, but just to make money to then buy other games. Um, I was always very fascinated by that. Then I worked in a game store uh, going, while I was at school, uh, wrote about games at university. And finally, my first real, real professional job was starting as an intern at Take-Two Interactive in Munich. And this is uh, where also the games industry gets crazy. You know, a couple of weeks after I joined, they sent me to the UK to help uh, finish the local uh, localized version, uh, not only on the language, but uh, I think most of you know, Germany has very specific rules on age rating. So I kind of have a mini credit on GTA 3 just after starting there for a couple of weeks. So I worked on three GTAs, on Stronghold. I helped the uh, uh, German version of Max Payne. That was kind of my first production job. So I became kind of this hybrid of producer, biz dev person, marketeer as a product manager, and so on. 15 years ago, I found the company Remote Control Productions. And uh, we do something which is quite unique in the gaming space. We help developers to be able to focus on development and grow for us it's less a money game you know at the moment everybody's like excited about embracer and what's going on on the stock market and unity is 25 billion and uh, whatnot that's all great um, that's fine but for us and for me uh, setting up development studios with new people uh, is more something we do out of passion and we want to mix it with professionality so it should be sustainable but it's important for us to see the long term. So here you see a couple of logos. I also do politics. So I'm the president of the European Games Developer Federation. Maybe some of you joined uh, an event we did in May called EGBG, which we organized pro bono and nonprofit um, to bring developers and publishers together. We work with politicians on a national basis, on a European one. We help basically for regulatory frameworks in Brussels, you know, sounds very bureaucratic and it is um, to a certain degree that we have the best environment to make games and publish games and all that. I also found uh, a culture cut called Videospiel Kultur. It's one of the biggest uh, archives for games. You know, that, that's the stuff I really love um, as, as a person. Um, and I'm quite proud that I was the executive producer on Angry Birds Epic, which was a JRPG on, on Angry Birds with one of our studios, Chimera Entertainment. So I already mentioned that we want to do this a little bit uh, philosophical. To me, it all starts with the why. Why are you doing this? If you consider yourself um, to become a studio head, found a new studio with your friends or join leadership of a smaller studio or mid-size, to me, it's always the question, why do you do this? And I think this is really, really important um, to reflect upon where you, who you are, where you're coming from, what inspires you, what are your triggers? You know, triggers are not necessarily awesome because they might get you upset. Uh, but what are your drivers? That's more on the positive side. Why are you doing this? Do you classic drivers are, you know, I do this for the financial security or I do this because I one point in time want to become so rich that I buy myself an island or, you know, myself, I'm doing this because I damn love games. Um, I think it's the greatest culture technique there ever was. It's also the dominant culture technique um, of this century. So I really urge you to not only you, but also your team think about why. 
And then if you have a better understanding on why you're doing it, it's the question of what is the vision for the studio? What's the vision for the company? Um, and a lot of the game development studios don't really think about this in the early days. They're kind of, you know, we want to make cool games. You know, that's fair. Um, but it would be ideal if you dive a little bit more into the details and think about what this actually means. Are you especially inspired to do multiplayer games because you want to connect people? Um, do you want to do uh, narrative kind of artsy games because you have a certain urge uh, to send out messages? Do you want to do social impact games or political ones even? Or are you uh, just want to do it for the money and whatsoever? Um, think about it and connect it to the why of yourself and the team and then um, derive a vision for the studio. And um, especially if your ambition is big enough, you know, back in the days uh, there was the saying, all streets lead to Rome. Theoretically, that's still true, right? You know, even if you go the other direction, if you go long enough, you will arrive there. And in the startup scene, you call it the, the B-hack, the big audacious hairy goals. Um, and I think it's quite uh, important to think about those, try to make them a bit concrete. They can still sound nuts, especially if you talk to your parents, um, but they should inspire your team um, and also give them kind of an idea on what you want to do. And uh, inspiring uh, your team is not only uh, necessary for the existing one, but if you want to uh, increase your team, bring in new people, that's what's called employer branding. Ideally, uh, those people have an idea, right? You know, as mentioned before, I work with Rockstar Games. There is a very strong idea out there uh, for players what Rockstar Games is, right? So I bet um, a lot of you, um, if you think of it from a professional point of view, would love to work there, even if some of their stories might be a bit extreme uh, and some of their daily realities, unfortunately, too, on what this actually means and how much skin in the game you have and how much sweat and tears you have to invest to do this. But if you're still following your vision, a lot of tears and sweat is to a certain degree okay. So think about that. Think about a vision going forward. So this was kind of the, the bigger outlook for maybe even 10 years, 20 years. How do you do this on a daily basis? In my opinion, you know, you're not only making games, why not think in games? I, I bet most of you played uh, MMOs back in the days or still do. Um, so you get, I guess, what I mean by life is an MMO. It's full of quests. There is repetitive ones. There is story quests. There are character quests. There are group quests and so on. What I'm trying to say here is that if you have a vision, you need to break it down into much smaller packages in a way. Uh, you can call this the strategy of the next one or two years, uh, for example. But um, even if you break it down one step further, uh, you could apply what's called objectives and key results, OKRs. Uh, what's important about those are they are kind of mini quests. They have a prerequisite on what you need to do to achieve them. And they are normally done um, not longer uh, than three months, which is based on an experience, a very good time frame to come up with concrete stuff, do it, and it still makes sense. Um, if you think about yearly goals, something like this, in my opinion, they should be more abstract because, you know, think about this year, haha. Uh -huh. Uh, your plan you made in January, it's definitely not how it turned out in the end of the year. So think in, uh, in your company and in life, I, I guess, as an MMO. And there's always a level up. Um, even if you fail, uh, you gain experience, right? You know, as long as you don't hit any gray mobs, right? There, you don't get any experience anymore because it's just you know, way too easy. But as long as you try uh, and take one step at a time, and even in failing, um, you will get experience. And what I really love um, about a kind of a Japanese point of view is that everything in life can be seen as a path to mastery. And might be not, you know, it doesn't need to be high end rocket science kind of stuff, um, but it could be everything. It could be how you shape your garden. Um, and to me, uh, nerdism is kind of equal love and mastery in a way. As a nerd, and I call myself a proud nerd in a way, 
is that I love the shit I'm dealing with. Uh, you see, I guess behind me, there's lots of comic books and merchandise, and you know, I, I own shit ton of games um, on Steam and the, what I mentioned with the archive and all that. You know, this is me. This is the love. But at the same time, I try to connect it with mastery, getting into it, you know, build my credibility, understand the shenanigans, what's really going on there, look behind the curtain uh, to become a master and do a level up. And, you know, newsflash, none of you, not even me, are a genius. Um, I believe that, you know, I'm maybe a bit, a bit, a bit average intelligent, but I'm you know, nothing special, I would say. Um, and I think it is very, very vital for everybody out there who thinks about strategy and who has a lot of passion that in the end, it's something you have to do in a group. You know, I could do what I do if I would not have, you know, dozens of colleagues with some of them being with us for 10 years or more um, who help shape and build on the vision. And I just play a role there. You know, it's like I'm, I'm a cock in the machine. I'm a part of a posse, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I'm definitely not the lone ranger uh, who thinks that I can solve everything myself because the lone ranger normally ends up being uh, addicted to alcohol and, you know, dies uh, uh, very lonely uh, in a bar somewhere. Uh, if you get the frigatively meaning here, um, I think everybody needs to be done as a team, as a group, since humans are actual, in the end, social beings. So when you look at this and what I said before, you know, it's also all metaphysical and blah, 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 blah. That doesn't mean we need to be always, you know, following this certain route or think something is a silver bullet. I always say, you know, we do this with an attitude. And that chips into the question uh, which I started with, of who are you yourself? Why are you doing this? You know, I love hip hop. I love, you know, NWA, um, if you get the reference here. Um, and it's the Mr. Smith, we always say in Germany, if something is boring, then it's a Mr. Smith. You know, it's a super generic name. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, he, they might wear gray suits. Uh, they blend in in everybody. It's not really flamboyant at all. You know, if that's your path, go ahead. Uh, but in my opinion, you need to have at least some kind of attitude, uh, which helps you to not get lost in the ever open, you know, opportunities and endless opportunities and uh, endless um, possibilities on how to make decisions. There, an attitude helps you uh, to basically put in some fixed variables of things you are fine with or you're not, or basically who you are as a person. And, um, you know, I could also use uh, a green screen. I don't, because that's me. That's who I am. And if you, uh, you know, think that's some professional to a certain degree, you know, me being a punk, punk ass, it's kind of, you know, fuck you. Um, that's me, accept it, or, you know, I don't want to deal with you. You know, another thing which is also important if you become a leader in a company and ideally even an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, as a CEO, there's always going to be some trouble um, around the door um, and around the next corner. And I think it's very important that you always understand that you are the captain and you need to behave like one. This is what I see as uh, relevant to me. You know, I have a certain responsibility for my people, for the company. Um, so if the ship, my company, gets hit, I protect the ship first. You know, I don't want to be Mr. Nelson winning the battle and die in the process necessarily. But if that's what it means and this is what it takes, then so be it. I will definitely not leave. You know, was, was this kind of a weird captain a couple of years ago who kind of left the ship first, uh, this big tourist one, and he went to prison for that because it's not who you're supposed to be if you're a captain. So behave like one. You have to deal with trouble. You have to be, at least to the outside, be a little bit stronger, be kind of a rock in the, in the turning waves um, and understand that this is your responsibility. You have to walk it um, and you are there to protect everybody else. 
And by the way, you know, being a captain also means that if someone on your team is not behaving right or undermines your authority on a repeated basis or, you know, uh, does a little mutiny, you know, you, you shoot them um, in a way. And uh, figuratively means you have to maybe consider to let them go. So I'm not advocating for you to be a hippie. I'm always nice to everybody because he asked the why question. That's not at all my message. Um, I think what is important is that you have an idea about all those things um, and what your decisions are in that realm. But on the captain part, I feel, and in most countries, it's legally even so, you are the one taking responsibility. So all what I talked about before is about you, about your team, your vision, da 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 da. But there's still a world out there, right? Um, you still have to act in an environment which is normally called the market, or you know, um, uh, with your target audience, or however, uh, however you want to look at it. But you have to understand that you are always acting in that context. So if you want to pursue you know, I have a tremendous respect, a game like uh, Disco Elysium, which was, was one of the best games in the last years. Um, they took tremendous risk, not only from the genre, but how they uh, basically um, told the story in the game. It took, as far as I understood, two, three years longer than expected. So those guys took tremendous risk, and I think they didn't really look at the market too much. It worked out for them pretty awesomely because they are really, really good at what they do. but what they did is an extreme risk taking. And in most cases, I would not advise that kind of level of risk. If you look at it from a captain's perspective and from a business perspective. So understand your market, dive into it quite a lot. You know, don't follow any, you know, pigs uh, chase through the village uh, too much where you don't have a, any idea about, you know, couple of years ago, you know, let's all make free to play games. I, I don't play them. I don't know about them, but this seems to be it, right? That's a really stupid idea. Um, so I think you should follow trends, um, first of all, to analyze them and understand them intellectually. Then you have to relate them to your company, to your team, to you. And then you can decide if this is, they make sense to pursue any of them, still checking what the drivers are and so on. And newsflash, uh, you know, some of you might remember uh, the E here uh, on, in the picture. Um, and um, you also get to get your numbers right. So you, I assume now, after all the slides before, uh, you have your team uh, there. They work together well. You understand a bit about the market. But you still have to understand your own numbers internally. You know, what's your cost? Uh, uh, yeah, sure, in the beginning. Cost is very low. Everybody's on pasta and tuna. That's all great. But sooner or later, you know, uh, you need to make a living uh, out of this. Your uh, your colleagues need to make a living out of it. Uh, you need to pay, pay taxes. Newsflash, you know, if you're profitable, you you have to pay taxes, and you even have to pay taxes beforehand if you're not. Uh, these are specific ones. You need to understand shit like that. And if you don't want to dive into it yourself too much, you need to bring in the uh, consultants, um, the service providers who do, um, and at least uh, let them explain it to you high level that you understand the concepts of it. And in the end, again, chipping into the responsibility, it's still your responsibility. And even in, in this case, in Enron's case, uh, some of the higher ups said, well, yeah, we didn't really understand it either anymore. You know, it doesn't free them from, in the end, going to prison. And I think it was well deserved. They should have put more of the team even in prison, in my opinion, because that was fucking fraud. And when we talk about the market um, and all that, this is what I said before, it should, it should still um, be uh, something which resonates to you. Um, and uh, why I put here Sims and said, maybe you hit relevant. In some cases, you know, it's not only about being super commercially successful, creating return of investments of a couple of thousands percent, or stuff like that. Um, in my opinion, the best case scenario, if you do something relevant, so you find an audience which likes it, you know, maybe some critiques like it too. Uh, you make money with it, not necessarily crazy money, but you know, you can 
ideally fund your next game. And um, on top of it, a game like Synths that actually made gaming history. So it is really relevant. And if on top of that, that's something which relates and resonates, I think it's even better. And on the part of MMO, I think a studio gets experience too. And that sounds a bit weird because, you know, of course, every individual gets more experience and so on. But I feel that, that the studio itself, even if it changes people and all that, kind of has its own path of levels. And there is many, many reasons why I think that is. And, and one of them before was the employer branding. Even if everybody at, at Rockstar Games would leave today, everybody they hire tomorrow will already have some idea of it and will bring in, if it's not just a bunch of uh, people straight of university, will bring in experience. And um, another point of view here is what's called games as a platform. And I'm not saying we build a platform like Facebook or anything like that, but if you make a racing game and this is successful and then you understand games as a platform, it means that you basically deduct what you have from the first game, technically from the game design, from the marketing and so on. And then you build on top of that. You know, there is so many games out there uh, who do this really well. And everybody knows Assassin's Creed. I, th I hope most of you also understand and remember Prince of Persia, it was pretty cool, because that's the roots of Assassin's Creed. You know, Assassin's Creed 1 is not the birthplace of this path for Ubisoft when they think games as a platform. So keep that in mind. Um, don't be too anal about it, in my opinion, uh, especially when you start out um, and you don't have crazy experience beforehand. Try out different stuff. And the one which kind of you know sticks to the wall and is successful to you and your studio, then start building on top of it um, because your studio gets experience too. You know, no philosophical uh, discourse, uh, in my opinion, with some kind of touching morals. In my opinion, this is very subjective. Uh, I try to do win-win-win situations because I believe in something like karma, not in a metaphysical way um, that we gather points and then we die and whatever. That's not what I mean. But if you are acting in a credible way, if your reputation is positive, if you are reliable, whatever all these um, kind of uh, things attached to you in your image are in reality, I think it will help you out. And the more of them being positive, the better. So in my opinion, win-win is a good thing and will help you in the long term. Uh, and also to me, it just makes me feel better too, which in the end also means, I think, that I can be more productive and more effective because I am living a more positive life. I'm very sorry, Hendrik, but we have to finish the lecture because we don't have any more time. I thought I have five minutes more, sorry. Uh, oh, that that was for, uh, so the lecture was supposed to be 20 plus five minutes for questions, but uh, we have to prepare for the next lecture. So maybe you can uh, sum it up in a minute so we can finish. Okay, um, you know, uh, I sum it up, think about uh, what you really want to do, um, get the context of the things, um, understand that this is not an easy job. It's a tough thing to build a studio over time, especially if you want to be make it sustainable. Live all the passion you have, but understand always, you know, there is a darker side of things where you have to understand that it's a business and never, never give up doing it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want uh, to reach out, if you want to understand a bit more what we do, if you're even interested in working with us together and the RCP family, here are some details to reach out. All the best to you. Um, enjoy the weekend later. Play some games and stay healthy. Cheers. Thank you very much, Hendrik, and hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye.